know, that's the thing. Orville is uh, is a fun show. Unfortunately, it's not in the Star Trek universe, but yeah. Uh, Moon Jumper Reviews, who cares what I think? That name is way too long, Moon Jumper Reviews, who cares what I think? I'm betting it will be serialized or partially serialized. I, I hope not, because, I mean, as stupid as it looks, serialized and that stupid would just be really bad. I don't know what that was about. Uh, Moon Jumper, who cares what I think? Gotta take it off as well. God bless. Enjoy it again. Thank you, Moon Jumper Reviews. Who cares what I think? But man, shorten that name. Please, shorten that name. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, it's, it's the name of my show. What can I do? Hey, folks, it's Moon Jumper, and I am once again throwing a wrench into my programming schedule. Hey, hey sorry, but, uh, well, we have almost breaking news that I want to be able to talk about it while it's still current. That's new for me. So, folks, we have a Star Trek trailer and an imminent premiere of a brand new Star Trek series on CBS All Access. It's called Star Trek Lower Decks from one of the producers of Rick and Morty, and we're going to talk about it right now. Let's take a drive. to episode 6 of Moon Jumper Reviews. Who cares what I think? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that is the full and complete name of my channel and my show, but you can simplify it. You can simply call me Moon Jumper, and the title of my show is Who Cares What I Think? If you do care, welcome. Please like, subscribe, share, hit that notification bell, and if you don't care what I think, then, well, Please like, subscribe, share, and hit that notification bell, and then I don't really care what you do. But if you want to stick around, that would be super all right by me, because we are talking Star Trek Lower Decks, a brand new animated comedy set in the universe of Star Trek, sometime shortly after Star Trek Nemesis. By the way, while I'm putting this video together, my internet is completely down and will not be fixed until Monday. So the images I'm throwing up there may be kind of limited and low res. I, I don't even have hotspot service on my phone, so I'm literally having to screen grab them from my cell phone and transfer them to my workstation computer. So please bear with me on that. On Wednesday, July 15th, Trek commentator extraordinaire Anti-Trekker was doing a live stream of which I was an audience participant, not in any way involved in the show itself, but just one of many watching and commenting on the live feed, and I was very humbled that the great and mighty Anti-Trekker read a couple of my comments aloud, because, you know, who cares what I think? But it's, you know, it's always interesting to hear his viewpoints on a whole host of topics, not just Star Trek. Super smart guy, one of the great sages of nerd culture, be sure to check him out if you haven't already, but uh, not until you watch this video, like and subscribe first, because I've got like, you know, 10 subscribers. <laughs> Help me out, please. Well, so, Mom, you know, at least Mom is watching. Mom, uh, what did you think of this Lower Decks trailer? What? No, 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 I I'm not talking about a travel trailer with an extendable deck. No, it's a trailer for a brand new animated Star Trek series. But unlike Star Trek the Animated Series from 1974, which was basically seasons 4 and 5 of Star Trek the original series, a rather serious high-concept science fiction series, which was actually able to explore worlds and phenomena that were much more fantastical than its predecessor because it was animated. It wasn't held back by the restraints of a 1960s live-action budget. The animators could draw anything their imaginations could conjure. So we got to see and experience things in the Star Trek universe we could never have seen in live-action. In fact, the closest thing we've come to it in live-action since then, well, you could make an argument for V'ger and Star Trek The Motion Picture. You know, if you could stay awake, it was certainly a visual masterpiece. Uh, but as far as TAS-like visual imagination, about the closest we've come to that in 
Trek live action, I would say would probably have to be the space orchids in Star Trek Picard. That's certainly the kind of thing you could expect to see in Star Trek the Animated Series. The difference, of course, would be that in Star Trek the Animated Series, they would have offered some kind of speculation as to why they exist. You know, Spock would have said something like, fascinating. They appear to be bioengineered for the purpose of blah blah blah. Star Trek Picard? No, the, the, the crew of La Serena, they're more like, oh, whoops, watch out for the giant space orchids, they might eat us, oh no! I'm like, wait, excuse me? Uh, giant space orchids? Uh, anybody curious about these things? You know, new life, new civilizations? No? Anybody? Nobody cares? They're, they're, they're just there. Okay. Uh, look, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, we've only seen the trailer. I, I would love to be pleasantly surprised that maybe Lower Decks will explore deeper than that. But based on what we've seen from Star Trek in the last few years, I suspect we'll see all kinds of crazy fantastical things, but only for the purpose of setting up adult-oriented slapstick comedy and bathroom humor comedy. I will be pleasantly surprised if they explore strange new worlds and new life all that deeply and profoundly as was actually done in Star Trek the animated series back in the 1970s. Now, does that mean that it's automatically going to suck? Does that mean that it cannot work as a straight-up comedy that just happens to be set in the Star Trek universe? No. Properly executed, it absolutely could work. If it turns out to be good, if it's more than just bathroom humor, if it's cleverly written comedy that actually makes me laugh... <laughs> You almost phasered me! Calm down, it's such a, uh, it was, it was such a stunt. <laughs> I mean, you know, see, that was funny. Then, yes, I absolutely could enjoy it simply for what it is, as a comedy. You know, not every Star Trek has to be the same. TOS and the first two seasons of Enterprise were both straight-up exploration adventures, and I, I, I think it's fair to say the same thing of Voyager. But think about Star Trek The Next Generation. There really wasn't all that much exploring going on. Yeah, I mean, every now and then you'd come across a, a Nagilum or weird spatial anomaly of the week, occasional first contact here and there, but Captain Picard was much more of an establishment diplomat than he was an explorer per se. Unlike the young Federation of the original series and pre-Federation days of Enterprise, where space was a wide open, unexplored wilderness, basically the Wild West in space, the Federation of the TNG era is long established, comfortable, bureaucratic. The Enterprise D is more of a luxurious cruise ship convention center that floats around the already explored galaxy, hosting diplomatic dinners for alien ambassadors that the Federation has already had relations with for years. It was a very different kind of Star Trek than its action-adventure wagon train in space predecessor. Deep Space Nine, which is actually my favorite of all the series, or, or you could say it's a very close tie with TOS, was far different even still a completely different kind of series. You know, the word Trek means voyage. There was very little trekking going on on DS9. It was primarily a geopolitical drama set on an alien space station. Not a lot of exploring, but damn good writing. Deep and thoughtful writing. And by far the most fleshed out character development of any set of characters in the Trek universe to date. Discovery? <laughs> right now, I'm not even going to try to define Discovery. That's that's another video. It, it, it's it's definitely its own thing. Now, Star Trek Picard is a little better. Love it or hate it, it at least takes place in a Star Trek universe which is recognizable as the Star Trek universe. Not everybody likes the direction it took. Not everybody likes its darker tone. But it is a Star Trek universe we recognize both visually and in terms of familiar characters played by familiar your actors, and plot threads with actual connections to previous canon. Again, not an exploration series in any way. Instead, it's an action spy-fi thriller set in the Star Trek universe, kind of different than what we've seen. So maybe Lower Decks won't have that high concept exploratory awe that Star Trek the Animated Series had. In fact, they've even said that this ship, the USS Soritos, isn't about exploring strange new worlds. Nothing like a cold beer after a smooth second contact. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah! But that doesn't mean that it might not be funny as hell. And as I said, if it's good, 
if it's well written, I can certainly enjoy it as a comedy, which just happens to be set in the Star Trek universe. Now, if it's all bathroom humor, then that will be disappointing. And that's my fear a little bit. I'm hoping it's going to be smart comedy and not just gross-out humor. If Star Trek's future success is hinging on fart jokes, we're in trouble. That would be pretty sad. But there are a couple of more things that puzzle me about Lower Decks, and we'll have to wait and see if they're even addressed. I, I suspect they won't be. The ship, the USS Cerritos. Uh, Antitrekker says it looks like a picnic table. And yeah, it, it is kind of weird looking, kind of ugly, but given the theme of the series, the phrase that have been using in the promotional material is that this is the least important ship in Starfleet. Now, if this is the least important ship in Starfleet, I don't think it's ugly enough. I think it looks too impressive. You basically have a galaxy class variant, uh, or kit bash, as the guys over at Trek Yards would say. Uh, you got a galaxy like saucer, maybe not quite as oval shape, a galaxy like engineering section, and like a galaxy class, it looks like it's huge. At the very least, it's a formidable looking ship of the line. It just doesn't come across to me as the least important ship in the fleet. If these guys, even the entire ship and crew are supposed to be the underdogs of Starfleet, to me, it would have been much more effective to come up with the smallest, crappiest starship they could, like an old beat-up Miranda class, but not even that good. Something that crewmen on the big prestige ships would make fun of, and that would be the point. The little ship that could. The little crew of misfits that could. It would be along the same lines as that old video game series I used to play. Roger Wilco, the Space Quest series, which was a Star Trek and uh, sci-fi in general spoof that featured a little guy and a group of sidekicks uh, who were in a Starfleet-like organization, except they were space janitors put in charge of a crappy little garbage cow, and, and but they're the ones who end up saving the galaxy. That's what this should be. And secondly, why are the main characters ensigns? An ensign is the lowest level commissioned officer, but if these are the true underdogs cleaning waste down in the lower bowels of the ship, it would be a lot more effective uh, for them to be enlisted crewmen. Uh, they, they shouldn't be officers at all. Uh, they, they should be grunts. This is kind of an ongoing trope in Star Trek for decades. We know that enlisted crewmen in Starfleet exist. They are occasionally referred to in dialogue. You do see them walking around the Enterprise in jumpsuits or specialized gear instead of officer uniforms. And we actually do have one main character who actually is an enlisted member of Starfleet. He is not a commissioned officer, and that's Chief O'Brien. You know, don't call me sir, I work for a living. We've heard him say that a number of times. He's the blue collar class of Starfleet. But Trek writers have a tendency to forget these enlisted guys and gals exist. Everyone is an officer. Everyone is at least an ensign, and that ignores a huge portion, probably the majority, of your crew. If these characters are supposed to be the true underclass down in the lower decks, they shouldn't even be ensigns. They ought to be enlisted. That looks like a couple of missed opportunities that would have helped set this underdog crew apart from everything we've already seen. The, the same old Starfleet bridge officers aboard the best ships of the fleet. This should have been the opposite of that. The underdogs of Starfleet aboard the crappiest ship in Starfleet, saving the day despite it all. But we'll see how it plays out. The other thing that has me a bit concerned, uh, look, I'm, now, I'm not one of these guys that gets all hung up on whether or not Michael Burnham or Ray from Disney Star Wars is a Mary Sue or not. If you got a badass female lead, great. Hey, chicks with guns are hot! Go back and watch my review of Underworld Blood Wars. Kate Beckinsale kicking ass in tight black leather is okay by me. Michael Burnham, as a character, is a perfectly fine character. Sonequa Martin-Green, a fine actress. I think the Discovery cast is top-notch. My problem with Discovery is that the show sucks. The writing is terrible. The continuity with the rest of the Prime timeline is a canonical disaster. That's my problem with it. Not Michael Burnham being a Mary Sue. Look. 
Captain Kirk was the hero. If we're honest, the original series really was not an ensemble piece. James T. Kirk was the big damn hero, and he had two trusted sidekicks to back him up, Spock and Bones. If Michael Burnham is supposed to be the big damn hero, then let her be the big damn hero. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But what I would have a problem with, well, let me put it this way. In the midst of the 1960s, when African Americans were struggling for equality, Lucille Ball, a woman, co-founder and executive producer of Desilu Studios, personally greenlit a science fiction series that would help change history. On the bridge of the Starship Enterprise, Captain Kirk was not surrounded by the same old bunch of white guys you'd see on any other show in those days. He was surrounded by men and women, white, black, Asian, alien. Each crew member were experts at their jobs. And in the three years that Star Trek aired on NBC, five years counting the animated series, not once, not one single time did Captain Kirk ever belittle Lieutenant Uhura or make fun of her. Not once was she ever portrayed as incompetent or buffoonish. Maybe she wasn't the captain or the main star, but she was vital. Kirk knew this, and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. knew this. He was a fan of the show, and he was a fan of her. He personally convinced Nichelle Nichols to remain on the series because he recognized that she represented something important a true liberal democracy in which all men and women are created equal, an enlightened civilization whose citizens are judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Well, fast forward to the apocalyptic year of 2020, the year we should be celebrating the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage, but that celebration is all but lost amongst the tribal splintering of cancel culture and identity politics. The opposite of inclusion, the opposite of diversity, the opposite of Dr. King's dream, or Gene Roddenberry's for that matter. Infinite diversity in infinite combinations. Now, prior to the Lower Decks trailer, we saw a handful of still images that CBS had released as promotional images, and what concerned me was that you had all these images of a diverse crew, which is what we want and what we expect out of Star Trek. But you got the sense that there's this one main character, Brad Boimler, who happened to be a white male. I mean, it seemed like maybe even as an underdog, are they going to present him as not even equal to his fellow underdogs? He's the scared, nervous, in incompetent buffoon and it's being portrayed as acceptable for his crewmates to make fun of and belittle him. I mean look, right here's our main badass heroine, Ensign Beckett Mariner, woman of color, kick-ass, all fine and good, I'm all for that. But in this particular drawing, acting very unnecessarily domineering over her scared, ineffective crewmate, Brad Boimler. I guess to be fair, she only has her arm around him, maybe it's supposed to be affectionate, you know, benefit of the doubt, but certainly at first glance, at first impression, and first impressions are important, it doesn't come off as affectionate. It looks like bullying. It looks like a borderline headlock. You talk about tone deaf in the year 2020. Now, to be fair, I think this came out before George Floyd. But even before George Floyd, it struck me as the schoolyard bully headlocking the class nerd and giving him a noogie. Maybe that's not how it's intended, but that is how it looks. And I'm not 100% convinced that it wasn't deliberate. Like it's not enough to show Beckett kicking ass to clue us in that she's awesome. Apparently, she can't be considered sufficiently awesome unless she is shown dominating her hapless, defenseless colleague who deserves it because he's the nerdy, incompetent white guy. What's the messaging here? Because I don't think that's what Dr. King had in mind. This is supposed to be Starfleet, the realization of Dr. King's and Gene Roddenberry's dream of a future where people of every color, sex, and even species stand proudly together, side by side, in a brighter, more inclusive, not exclusive, future. I don't recall Captain Janeway ever headlocking Tom Paris and laughing at him, even when he annoyed her. She valued him. Bellana Torres even married him, and Tom and Bellana had great lovers' quarrels, as any couple does, but she never bullied him or tried to dominate him, and she's a Klingon! Physically, she could probably knock Tom through a wall, but she didn't. 
because good and caring people who see each other as equals do not behave that way. Even when they can, they don't, because that's not who they are. So this had me a little concerned about what the messaging of this new Star Trek series was going to be. But now that I have seen the trailer, I'm a little less concerned. I'm a little more cautiously optimistic. Now, it's just a trailer, but it did make me laugh. And the two main characters, Beckett and Brad, are clearly best friends. Her ribbing of him is playful, loving, maybe even flirtatious, but it's not coming off as mean-spirited. And yeah, you know, he's a nerd, kind of buffoonish, but she's pretty damn buffoonish herself, and clearly gets them both into all kinds of trouble. We're not really elite. We're more like the cool, scrappy underdogs. We are so getting fired for this. Just from the trailer, I'm okay with it. It was funny. And visually, it seems to be honoring the canon. The ship, the bridge, the corridors, the L cars, the phasers, even the uniforms are all post-TNG era appropriate. And I appreciate that. That is important. Are you listening, Discovery? Are you listening, Discovery spin-off Strange New Worlds? Visual canon is canon. You know, Disney Star Wars, love it or hate it, you gotta give them credit for honoring the visual style of the 1970s. The Millennium Falcon still looks like the Millennium Falcon. That is important when it comes to fictional world building. You just cannot dismiss it. So I appreciate the love and care the Rick and Morty guys have put into visually recreating this post-TNG era. A little disappointed that they didn't carry through with the uh, first contact late DS9 uh, black and gray uniforms, which I think are the best looking uniforms in the Star Trek canon. You know, it's, it, it's ironic that the best looking uniforms will canonically become some of the shortest lived, chronologically speaking. Uh, at, you know, as I understand it, Lower Decks is set very shortly after Star Trek Nemesis. At the same time, that's a legitimate artistic choice. It's not a break in continuity. It is set after Nemesis. They could have changed uniforms, and artistically, I get it. Black and gray looks great on film, but in animation, you, you're probably going to want the brighter colors. You just want it to pop. So I get it. I, I can give that a pass. And these uniforms, they work because they are era appropriate. I'm looking at you, Discovery. You know, even JJ got the uniforms right, and JJ Trek is set in a separate timeline. Discovery didn't even try. And even when they gave the Enterprise crew colored uniforms in Season 2, they still got it wrong. So I appreciate this animated series appears to be honoring the canon, at least visually. As far as the writing, well, we'll just have to wait and see. I never judge a movie or series before I have seen it. I know, crazy, right? I may like it, I may hate it, but I will decide that after I have viewed it no matter what anybody else thinks. I have a right to my opinion, you have a right to yours. We can still be friends. A lot of people hate Star Trek Picard. I actually thought it was okay. Not great, there are a number of things I would have done differently, and I thought the ending of season one was rather weak. But there were some things I really liked about Picard. It was okay, especially compared to Discovery, which was kind of a disaster. And again, not because of the cast or characters, but because the showrunners did not honor the source material. Whereas, it looks as though Lower Decks just might. I'm going to give it a chance, and I encourage others to do that as well. But that's just me, and who cares what I think. From deep in the heart of Texas, I am Moonjumper. Please like, share, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments below. All I ask is, please keep it civil. You know, I'm one of the biggest Trekkies on the planet. I'm one of these guys that can quote dialogue, but at the end of the day, it is just a TV show. Coming up on future installments of Who Cares What I Think, a review of OT networks h and i and antenna tv i'll be discussing some of the programming on those channels including wonder woman highlander and more then in the following weeks a deep dive into star trek picard versus discovery the adventure video game siberia 3 and 1977's man from atlantis starring patrick duffy before he stepped out of the shower so subscribe now and see y'all next time <laughs>